Hello, my name is Omri Gazit. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Asserto, an authorization company. And I'm very excited to spend the next 30 or so minutes with you talking about fine-grained authorization and why everybody's so excited about it. First, a little bit about myself. I've spent well over three decades building software for developers. Um, the last 15 years of which uh, were really focused on cloud platforms uh, in identity and access in particular. Uh, I love doing startups. This is my third startup. Uh, and when I'm not startuping, I'm skiing. I was super fortunate to have worked on some really cool projects uh, over my career. Uh, I was one of the co-founders of the .NET project at Microsoft, uh, as well as the Azure project, where I, was, uh, I worked on Azure Access Control Service that became Azure Active Directory. Uh, and then the last 10 years, I spent a lot of time in the open source space, uh, working on things like OpenStack and specifically I am an OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, where I was uh, a board member, um, Puppet and Kubernetes. So let's start by talking about the differences between authentication and authorization. Some people talk about them as being the same thing, auth, but they really are two distinct processes. Authentication is really about proving that you are who you say you are. So in the old days, we used to do it using emails and passwords. And these days we have password lists and biometrics and magic links and two factor, uh, but ultimately it's the same process. And the ecosystem at this point is pretty mature. We've had standards in the space for almost 20 years now. SAML is the OG, the original gangster of um, uh, single sign-on standards uh, and OpenID Connect has been around for about nine years, uh, OAuth 2 a little bit longer than that. And we also have some fairly mature developer services, right? So you can use Okta or Auth0 or Azure Active Directory or Cognito uh, to be able to implement login without having to write it yourself. In fact, no one writes login anymore. Everybody uses a developer service. So this is mostly a solved problem for developers. Authorization, not so much. Now authorization is once you're logged in, what can you do in the context of this application? And specifically, do you as a user have this particular permission on this particular resource? Now, there are not any real standards in the space as of yet. Certainly there are patterns like RBAC and ABAC, which we'll talk about later. Um, and there's also no implementations at scale, at least, of developer services, right? Every framework, every language has uh, a set of libraries uh, every framework has a set of libraries that help you build uh, authorization, but really every one of these implementations is fairly inconsistent. And that creates a lot of problems. The first one is bad security. Uh, and the case in point is that number one on the OWASP top 10 list of application security issues is broken access control. So they've tested uh, a whole bunch of applications and like a whopping 94% of the applications that they tested have had some sort of broken access control vulnerability. So this is a huge problem um, uh, in terms of security. Now, not to mention the fact that if every microservice implements permissions differently, you have a, a bunch of inconsistency in the application and it's really hard to reason about the authorization surface area of your application. Not to mention the opportunity cost. Imagine that you had to go build login uh, by yourself or text messaging or uh, payments or things like that. That's just a whole bunch of wasted effort. Um, and that is unfortunately still the state of the art with authorization. Every application essentially rolls their own. Now things are not all bad. It turns out that a lot of technology organizations in the last couple of years have been looking at authorization as something that they need to centralize. And they've been, been giving it to their platform services teams or central services teams to go build a single consistent implementation. And they're writing about it. So a lot of technology organizations have written papers or blog posts or have given talks about how they do authorization. And if you look at um, all the different patterns uh, that they've written about, there are really five that bubble up to the surface. And we contrast those here with some of the old school or anti-patterns. The first one is that each service does its own authorization. This one's kind of obvious, right? And the modern best practice is that these technology companies are basically empowering their central services teams to go build a purpose-built authorization service that all the other microservices can actually go rely on. 
The second uh, anti-pattern is to use coarse-grained rolls that are baked into the applications. And the modern best practice is to uh, replace that with fine-grained access control, really adhering to the principle of least privilege. What that principle means is you want to basically give as much permission to the user as they need to be able to do their job, but no more than that. And the reason why is because if you have a compromised identity, you want to limit the blast radius of what that user can do. And so it just makes sense to lock down permissions as much as possible. And that really is the, the impetus for fine grained access control. The third one is that, you know, you find in the, you know, kind of old school way of doing things, authorization built as a bunch of if and switch statements in each of the microservices. So authorization spaghetti code is what we call it. And the best practice is to extract the authorization logic out of the microservice, out of the application, and store it and version it separately, really achieving a separation of concerns that enables in turn uh, another important security principle called separation of duties. So you have the application developers worrying about the application code, and then you have people who really reason about the authorization surface area, able to go look at all the authorization policy all together and figure out uh, whether that authorization policy makes sense. The fourth anti-pattern is treating uh, scopes that are baked into access token as permissions and the modern best practice is to make a real-time call to an authorization service right before you want to grant access to a protected resource, so real-time access checks. Why is uh, relying on scopes baked in access tokens bad? Well, you know, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, they basically have a lifetime. So as soon as you mint that access token, it's good for two hours or two days for, for as long as that access token is good for. And so if you want to actually take away permissions, uh, that's not quite possible without token revocation, which is a, which is a really complicated thing. Uh, if you're making a real-time access check right before you grant access to a protected resource, you don't need to rely on essentially kind of uh, stale tokens. The other thing that uh, these tokens don't really give you uh, the ability to do is fine-grained access control. So let's say that you wanted to grant somebody the right to read a document. If you put a read document scope in an access token, well, you know, the calling application can go look at that scope and say, okay, uh, the user can read a document, but which document? All the documents? Are you going to go create a scope for every document that the user has access to at login time? You know, clearly it's just not a scalable practice. And then lastly, um, most applications, sadly, barely even have a trace of the, you know, the, the folks who have logged into them much less any kind of fine-grained audit trail of what users have done in the application. And the modern best practice is to have comprehensive monitoring, basically uh, record the decision log for each decision that the application made and be able to centralize that for compliance and forensics. Again, you know, a breach is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when at this point in time. And so once you detect that something happened, you really want to know why it happened. You want to have the forensics uh, to figure out how the application uh, did the authorization, what you know the application authorized the user to do. Uh, and of course, it's also very important for compliance. Uh, you need to be able to prove that users were only able to do what they were allowed to do within the scope of the application. Great, so let's dive into each one of these. The first one I want to dive into is these, uh, this idea of purpose-built uh, authorization service. It seems like it's the new hotness. Everywhere we look, uh, there's some tech company that's writing a paper about it. So it started out about three years ago with Google uh, writing about their Zanzibar system. Zanzibar is basically their uh, distributed system for uh, access control for a wide variety of Google services. Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Calendar, uh, um, Cloud, and so on and so forth. And um, it's a large-scale, planet-scale service, uh, and one of the things that they've done is they've created essentially this new model uh, that they coined the term relationship-based access control for, and we'll talk about that uh, in a couple of slides. Um, Intuit uh, built one that's based on a different set of principles, more of an uh, attribute-based model. Himeji from Airbnb was inspired by Zanzibar. In fact, uh, you know, the architect for Himeji 
uh, was one of the folks on the Zanzibar team. Steve from Carta was also inspired by the Zanzibar paper. Netflix is again more of an ABAC model. So we have different types of implementations, but all these folks are basically building uh, these centralized services and so that you know every one of their application teams doesn't have to reinvent that wheel. The next principle is fine-grained access control. And so let's go down a trip down the memory lane here and talk about how that's evolved over the years. So back in the 80s and 90s, we had uh, Unix systems and later on Linux systems uh, and NT, and those relied on access control lists. Basically, the type of question that you answered with an access control list was, does Alice have read access to this file? A file system had read, write, and execute bits uh, for users and groups and other, and that was basically the uh, as fine-grained an access control model as you could get uh, with Linux systems. Now, in the 90s and 2000s, we saw uh, this new idea called the directory. LDAP uh, and later on Active Directory basically uh, ushered in this idea of role-based access control. So roles were typically implemented as groups. So you, for example, had a group in LDAP or Active Directory that you would put users in, and that would correspond to a role in a business application. And you could answer questions like, is Bob in the sales admin role by seeing whether Bob was in that group you had this idea of nested groups, and you know life was kind of simple but pretty clunky and very much coarse-grained. The problem there was that you had this group explosion where uh, at Microsoft, I remember we had, uh, let's call it you know 50,000 users uh, at, at one time and 250,000 groups. Uh, so it was impossible to reason about what permissions uh, users actually had. In the 2000s and 2010s, we had this new idea called attribute-based access control. And the idea there was that you basically computed access control decisions based on attributes, either on the user or on the resource or even environmental attributes. So you could answer questions like, is Mallory have access if Mallory is in the sales department and the document is in the sales folder and it's currently working hours. Um, so you could write a policy that evaluated all those attributes and gave you a yes or no answer. The, you know, the original system that implemented this uh, was known as Exacmo. Uh, that's kind of like the original gangster of uh, the ABAC systems. And of course, uh, you know, now in the last five years, we've had successors to that. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. And lastly, uh, we have relationship-based access control. Like I said before, it actually predates the Google Zanzibar paper, but Google uh, really repopularized that model. Uh, and the idea is that you basically have relationships defined between subjects and objects. So for example, uh, a subject like Eve is a user and she can be in a group. Uh, and that group can have, say, view access on a folder. And there can be documents inside that folder. And so we can answer questions uh, like, does Eve have read access to this document uh, by chasing the edges that link uh, between that subject, Eve, and the object, uh, the, that particular document, and see whether those edges carry the read permission. So after the history lesson, uh, let's uh, fast forward to the present. Over the last five years, we've seen two different ecosystems emerge around fine-grained authorization. The first one I call the policy as code camp. Uh, and the flag bearer for that is the open policy agent project, uh, which basically started from the ABAC uh, view of the world. And so there's a lot of stuff going for it. It's a CNCF graduated project. It graduated about two and a half years ago. So there's a single mature open source implementation. It's a general purpose decision engine, uh, fairly flexible and primarily used today for infrastructure authorization scenarios like Kubernetes admission control. Uh, and it's really tailor-made for policy-based access management and ABAC. It's essentially the successor to Exacmo. Now, there are some drawbacks as well. The language is, has a high learning curve. So unless you're a prolog head, you know, this is a side effect free data log derivative. Uh, and you have to kind of go build your authorization model from first principles. It's really an unopinionated language. So you have to kind of design your authorization module, model from scratch. And it's a little like, you know, writing something in assembler language. And furthermore, you really don't have much help with how to manage data in the system. OPA has a, an effective policy plane, but it doesn't really have a data plane. So if you want to start with OPA, you have to kind of roll that out on your own. 
On the other side, there's the Zanzibar model. Uh, I call this the policy as data camp. And like I said before, Google uh, built their uh, model over an abstract model called Reback, uh, relationship-based access control. They didn't invent it, but they certainly popularized it. Uh, if OPA has no opinions, Reback has plenty of opinions, it's a very opinionated model. Uh, and the idea is, again, like I said, you're modeling your um, access control rules essentially as data, as a set of relationships between subjects and objects. And so if your domain looks a lot like Google Docs, you have subjects like users and groups uh, and objects like uh, folders and files, you can uh, very much use this as an opinionated model that you can start from. Now, it's a fairly immature ecosystem. There are at least half a dozen uh, competing open source implementations uh, because Google didn't open source anything. They didn't even write a spec. They, built, uh, they wrote a technical report. So there are uh, a bunch of different uh, open source implementations at this point, and they don't really share uh, any common schema language or a common data language. Uh, and it's also hard to extend the Reback model into uh, attributes, although some of these projects are starting to do that. Uh, they're, they each do it in kind of an inconsistent way as well. Now, fortunately, there's a third path. Uh, we call this the uh, don't succumb to the tyranny of the ore. Uh, a lot of people think of these as competitive ideas, but we think of them as complementary. And so Topaz is a project uh, that Asserto, my company, maintains. But the idea there is to take the best of both worlds. You take the decision engine from OPA, and so you have a policy-based access control model. Uh, that is uh, supports attributes, and you take the Zanzibar directory and you kind of put them together in a single open source project uh, that's delivered as a single container image. So here I have a, as a reference, a URL to Topaz. Uh, go check it out. Uh, the QR code will also take you to the GitHub repo. The next principle I wanna talk about is policy-based access management. And as a reminder, this is the idea of lifting the access control logic out of the application where it's uh, expressed as if or switch statements and instead expressing it in its own domain specific language uh, and storing and versioning it as code, just like any application artifact. So here I have a policy written in Rego, uh, which is the uh, surface syntax for the open policy agent. This happens to be a Topaz policy uh, because it has a little bit of an Easter egg here uh, that uh, basically uh, makes a call to one of the Topaz built-ins uh, that computes the policy based on a relationship between a subject, the user, and an object, uh, one of their reports. So this policy has two allowed clauses. One of them uses attributes. So uh, basically you're allowed if the uh, logged in user's property is uh, department property, I should say, equals operations, or you're allowed if you're the manager of uh, this particular user. And so it's important to note that uh, it's not just OPA that uh, adheres to this principle. Any Zanzibar-based system also equally believes that you should extract that policy logic. Don't express it as if and switch statements inside of your application. Instead, store and version it, it as a domain model. But what does that get you? Basically, instead of having to go, again, like I said, write if we're st st switch statements to express authorization logic, you can go use a middleware. So here we have this check auth z middleware that we've placed in the dispatch path of uh, this route handler for this Node.js, this Express.js uh, route handler. And all we have to do is just uh, tell the developer to make sure to call that middleware. That middleware makes a call to an authorization service that computes a decision. If that decision comes back as uh, you know, access denied, uh, the whole route gets uh, basically returns an access denied. Otherwise, you dispatch to the next handler here. What does that give you? Uh, it allows you to store and version uh, that policy artifact just like you do application code. And every policy change is part of a git change log. So every access control change that you want to make in the policy is logged just like any other uh, git change. Uh, so that means that the policy can evolve uh, from using a different team. So a different team like the security team can own that policy and it's decoupled from the application logic. The application delivery team doesn't have to worry about uh, how to evolve that access control logic. And the security team can reason about the entire surface area, uh, authorization surface area of the application. Lastly, we think of these policies as 
something that you should treat just like any application artifact. So application code, you build into an immutable image, typically in a Docker container. That's how you distribute it. And that's the same thing that you should do with policies. You should build them into OCI images and sign them using something like Cosign to secure uh, the software supply chain for these artifacts. And in fact, here I have a reference to a project called the Open Policy Containers Project, which is a CNCF uh, sandbox project. Asura was also involved with that. Uh, and you can build not just Topaz policies, but also any generic OPA policy into a container image, sign it with Cosign, and verify the signatures. And lastly, I want to talk about real-time access control. So this is where I kind of go into my infomercial about authorization actually being a distributed systems problem. And I'll explain why I, what I mean by that. You really need to do authorization locally. Authorization is different than any other developer service because if you think about uh, things like Stripe or Twilio or even Auth0, those are hosted services and it's fine for them to be hosted because you basically make a call to them and it's important that that call complete and it's important that they maintain you know, a high SLA. But you know, it doesn't really matter if it happens in a second uh, because it turns out that it's not really in the critical path of every application request. Whereas authorization is, if you're doing it correctly, uh, you're basically making a call to the authorization system right before you grant access to a protected resource. And that can happen one or more times for every user request. So it's got to be fast. It's got to be done in around a millisecond. And it's got to be 100% available to the calling application. So it can't really be a hosted service. But... Um, you also want to be able to manage all of the policies and the data that's used for authorization in a centralized manner. So you really need to have some kind of control plane that allows you to manage the life cycle of policies uh, and as well as uh, you know, all, the, uh, all the data, all the user and group and resource data that are used for policy decisions uh, and relationships and be able to mediate those decision logs back to a, a centralized control plane. So data uh, about users comes from an identity providers, uh, data from you know, the source code for policies comes from a source code control system, and then decision logs really want to end up in your SIEM tool, in your log aggregation tool. So you really need kind of this central control plane that allows you to manage all this stuff at scale. So as we bring this presentation to a close, I want to close with what we call the five laws of authorization. If you're building an authorization system for your entire organization, you want to have it have the following five properties at the very least. You want it to be fine grained and you want it to be also flexible enough to support all the different types of authorization models. So RBAC, ABAC, RBAC, any combinations of them. You want to make it policy based. So you really want to make sure that you give the opportunity to the application developers to not have a bunch of switch and if statements in their code and instead allow them to extract the authorization policy out of their applications and store and version it, into, in it as its own artifact that you can actually go build into a signed image. Make sure that authorization is done in real time as a local call executing over fresh data. And yet you want to have central management of the policies and all the resource data that are used in authorization decisions. And finally, you want to aggregate, centralize and aggregate all the decision logs that come out of these authorization requests so that you can use those later for compliance and forensics. And if you're building a system like this, you also want some non-functional requirements. Like you want to make it super easy for your developers to adopt. So uh, you want to uh, have a system that allows you to do authorization uh, to an external system with a single line of code. You want to be able to have it integrate with all of the systems you already have. So identity providers, uh, source code repositories, artifact registries, logging systems. And finally, uh, it's important for it to be open. Uh, so you get a lot of ecosystem effects from betting on Kubernetes native technologies like Open Policy Agent and Topaz. Now, this is a lot of work to do, and fortunately, there are some places to start. There are open source projects that you can start from. OPA is one of them. Topaz is one that I've talk, talked about as well. It's the project that my company maintains, so we're very partial about it. Uh, 
Um, this is a QR code for getting to the repo. And Topaz, uh, we like to say that it's fast, flexible, and easy. Fast, uh, it does authorization in under a millisecond. Flexible, it supports all the different uh, access control models, all the backs, as we like to say, R back, A back, and reback. It runs in any cloud. And finally, easy. It has SDKs, uh, it has gRPC APIs, it has REST APIs, GraphQL APIs, SDKs from every language. So it's super easy for your developers uh, to incorporate no matter what language they're using. And lastly, my company, Asserto, uh, basically builds commercial solutions for authorization. So if this is not something that you want to roll out by hand using open source, uh, we're happy to provide you ready-made solutions. Thank you so much for listening over the last uh, almost 30 minutes. Uh, please come find me on social. I'm Omri G at Twitter. I'm Omri at Asura.com. If you have any questions or comments, uh, we'd love to answer. Uh, join our Slack. Uh, it's at Asura.com slash Slack. Uh, check out our repo. Uh, that's Asura-dev slash Topaz on GitHub. And uh, let us know what you think. Thank you so much.